Today, at the end of Personalized Oncology Month, we're also seeing the report, uh, the launch of a new report titled Together Against Cancer, How Can Europe Benefit from Breakthroughs in Personalized Oncology? And this is your first chance to chat and to hear from the authors of this report live, but also to set the agenda for what we're going to be discussing in the webinar. So later on, once we've had a run through of the top findings for, of the report, you will be asked to vote on the topics that you want discussed in more depth. Don't worry, I will give you instructions on how to do that later on. And then when we go into the panel discussion, you'll also be able to take part directly, whether you want to ask your questions or make comments in person, or if you prefer to do it via the Q&A function, then you can also post questions or comments that way. So the two big things that are going to be really key today that are different are you get to set the agenda, so no excuses, and also that you will be able to take part live and actually put your questions directly to the panel. So as I mentioned before, uh, I will be uh, giving you instructions on how to vote later on. You can also find the report link if you haven't had a chance to download it yet in the chat box and the side of this webinar. So do make yourself available to read it, although obviously pay attention to us in the meantime. And in the before that, we're going to have a quick overview of the report's top line findings from Dr. Panos Kanavos from the London School of Economics, who is, of course, one of the report's lead authors. So Panos, over to you. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, one sec. And good afternoon, uh, everyone. And thank you for the um, opportunity to present to you the report on access to personalized oncology in Europe. First of all, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Jennifer Gill, um, Anna Maria Fontrier, and uh, Aurelio Miracolo. It's been a pleasure to work with all of them in the preparation of the report. Um, I should start by saying that the report should also be seen in conjunction with a number of uh, initiatives at the uh, European Union level, um, to which it serves as a complement. First of all, uh, Europe's beating cancer plan. Secondly, the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe. And thirdly, the initiative on uh, digital health and care. Can I have the, um, the second slide? Thank you. Um, the development of personalized oncology where the um, right cancer treatment is given to the right person at the right time, uh, determined by the use of biomarkers, is predicted to lead to better outcomes and reduce risk of side effects for cancer patients, as well as reducing costs and improving uh, efficiencies for healthcare systems. Now, against this background, the report is uh, building on uh, work done already by organizations such as FPS Oncology Platform, the European Cancer Patient Coalition, and the Cancer Drug Development Forum uh, to produce a thorough, we hope, analysis of the state of personalized oncology utilization across Europe. It aims to uh, review the value discussion and characterize um, the benefit of personalized oncology analyze factors affecting decision-making related to patients' access to innovative personalized oncology, and last but not least, develop a set of policy recommendations related to overcoming existing challenges and incentivizing the development and adoption of personalized oncology. Now, in terms of the um, challenges for the uptake of personalized oncology across Europe, a number of them have been identified in the report via a combination of primary and secondary uh, data collection and evidence analysis. These challenges span three separate but interconnected uh, areas. First of all, um, effective evidence generation, which can be both operational but also recruitment related. Secondly, issues around regulation, meaning that current regulatory rules and practices around the use of personalized oncology can affect the timings of medicine approval. And finally, value determination and uh, reimbursement, where it has been shown that uh, health technology assessment processes, as well as pricing and reimbursement policies can vary, and in fact, can vary significantly across Europe. Uh, and this may influence uh, access to personalized oncology treatments. Uh, beyond the, um, the challenges that we have identified, the report goes on to clarify and identify, as well as discuss the benefits of personalized oncology, 
uh, which fit into three categories as follows. First of all, the benefits for patients. Uh, and it goes without saying that personalized oncology medicines can target subgroups uh, of patients most likely to respond well to the interventions in question. And this is a move away from more traditional uh, use of uh, medicine where uh, medicines that may not be optimal for the patient in question are utilized from the outset towards a situation where optimal medicines are prescribed as early as possible. Uh, and that can lead to better patient-related outcomes, it can lead to better adherence, um, and it can increase, in overall, uh, can increase overall survival and lower risks uh, of side effects. That's the first uh, area of uh, benefit to patients. The second is socioeconomic benefits, and I would like to highlight such benefits uh, with an example. The use of personalized oncology can reduce the length of hospital stays, from the average week for patients treated with chemo uh, to an average of three to four days for those using personalized oncology medicines. So the, those benefits, therefore, from a socioeconomic perspective can be significant. There are also benefits to um, health systems, and I think it's important to reflect on that one. So whilst expenses may appear to be higher in the short term due to additional costs in uh, uh, companion or biomarker testing, for example, in the longer term, there may be savings to be made from a healthcare system perspective. Um, research has indicated that between 2008 and 2014, uh, about 460 million euros uh, was saved in treatment with an expenditure of just over 11 million by testing for EGFR biomarkers in over 16,000 lung cancer patients to determine who would respond to available treatment uh, and who would not. Um, and of course, that ties in with the agenda of reducing uh, wasteful use of resources at the healthcare system level. The research I just mentioned uh, comes from France. Um, can I just turn to uh, the policy recommendations, which I think uh, are uh, derived from the uh, report itself? Can we have the next slide? Thank you. So in terms of the um, recommendations, uh, the report, first of all, acknowledges that innovation that in the uh, innovation in the personalized oncology arena has the potential to significantly improve patient outcomes and foster patient-centered care. A favorable policy environment uh, will be needed therefore to maximize any potential future impact of personalized oncology medicines. Now in the report we have produced a set of policy recommendations which uh, actually sit in three key areas. However the following five that you uh, see on this slide here um, are worth noting and perhaps prioritizing. First of all, it's important to have a European strategy on personalized oncology in Europe, including a roadmap for change, setting out basic principles and objectives for the future uh, with enhanced levels of uh, European harmonization and supported by appropriate resource. That's the first one. The second one relates to EU harmonization of ethics and ethics approvals. Uh, which is needed to allow the sharing of anonymized and protected patient data at uh, a European uh, network based on appropriate informed consent procedures. Um, the third area is uh, the incorporation of uh, updated information relevant to personalized oncology uh, in curricula, in undergraduate and postgraduate uh, post curricula for healthcare professionals, as well as a mechanism incorporating education and knowledge around specific advancements relevant to personalized oncology. In addition, patient associations and advocacy groups, as well as clinicians, should work uh, towards giving uh, what we call health literacy, a higher priority so that patients feel empowered uh, as advocates for the integration of personalized oncology into their care. The fourth area, which we think is, is important, relates to um, uh, all eligible patients uh, being able to have access to fully reimbursed and actionable biomarker testing built into standardized patient pathways at diagnosis and, uh, and disease progression. The final area, which uh, I think we think is important, uh, relates to the acceptance by health technology assessment agencies of newer uh, trial designs, for example, basket and umbrella trials. Um, and it's also important for the European Network for Health Technology Assessment model uh, to incorporate a personalized oncology pathway specifically focused on new models of, uh, of uh, evidence generation. So these were the five key areas that we thought were worthwhile prioritizing. As I said in the report, there's a, 
uh, a set of uh, three major areas of recommendation. With that in mind, um, I do hope you find this report of interest. It is aimed to uh, generate debate and discussion, and um, I look forward to it. Thank you Thank very you. much for your attendance. Thank you very much, Panos. And we're going to come back to those three clusters in a moment. But just briefly, if you could, could you give us an indication of how much progress has been made when it comes to personalised oncology in the past decade? Well, Laura, I think we have we have witnessed significant uh, improvements over the past uh, over the past uh, uh, decade or so. Um, one of the key areas relates to uh, significant progress, uh, for example, in cancer survival. I think this is uh, immediately observable. Um, for instance, back in uh, 2010, the five-year su survival from uh, stage three and four melanoma was five percent. Um, today, in 2020, it's um, 52 percent. So have a significant impact, therefore, on uh, uh, on cancer survival, um, and that's partly due to um, uh, personalised oncology. But there are a couple of other indicators which are worth noting, and uh, and obviously uh, the future, if we if we take what I said about uh, stage three and four melanoma into into consideration, looks possibly fairly bright. And one of them is the uh, that as of uh, March this year, uh, we have 65 or 66, if I remember correctly, uh, different cancer treatments based on 25 molecular tumor alterations that have been approved by the uh, US Food and Drug Admin uh, Administration and, um, and the European Medicines Agency. And, the, and last but not least, at the moment, we have three uh, or more tumor agnostic therapies that are approved and in the pipeline, there's, a, there's about 10 more. So uh, I think ultimately the aim is to effectively uh, move from, a, from, from treating cancer based on tissue of origin to uh, treating cancer based on, uh, on a genetic basis. So I think it's a, it, it's a significant uh, uh, improvement uh, overall, and we're probably going to see all that in the, in the very near future. So three indicators, therefore, to tell us a lot about where we're moving. Thank you very much, Panos. And um, Panos is going to be here, obviously, throughout the session. So I know we have some questions coming in and we will put them to him later on. You will be able to ask them. Uh, but we're going to move on to actually deciding what we're going to talk about now. So Panos, can you quickly remind the audience, you mentioned this idea of sort of three groupings or three clusters of recommendations. Now, audience, pay attention here because we're going to stick these up on the screen. And in a moment, we're going to ask you to vote on which topic we should discuss first. So just to give you some quick rules on how it's going to work. You have three topics up here. So topic one, stronger collaborative endeavors for personalized oncology. Topic two, investing in infrastructure to address the challenges faced by uh, personalized oncology. And topic three, improvements in the institutional structures surrounding personalized oncology treatments. So these are the three things. Now we have three distinct parts that we can talk about these in. So the first one will be 25 minutes, including listening to the panel, getting top line findings from panels, but also giving you the chance to ask questions or make comments uh, via chat, I mean via Q&A or unmuting. The second one will be 15 minutes and the third one will be 10. But we'd like you to prioritize the positive knockout effect here. So in the first round, when we ask you to vote, vote for the topic that you would like to see discussed in the most detail. And we'll stick the poll up in a moment. But before we do that and help you think uh, what topics you'd like to focus on, I'll just briefly introduce our panel if they would kindly switch their cameras on for a moment, just to tell so that you have an idea of who's going to be uh, taking your points and questions. So I'm very pleased to welcome Mark Lawler, <coughs> excuse me, Sorry, I've got a frog in my throat here. Uh, Mark Lawler, who is from the, just a moment, I apologize very much for this, Scientific Committee member from the European Cancer Patient Coalition. We also have uh, Professor Yap Bewey, who's the Managing Director of, cancer drug, of the Cancer Drug Development Forum. Dr. Brian Cuffell, who is the VP and Head of Market Access for Oncology at Bayer. And joining us from the European Parliament is MEP Deirdre Kloon, who from the EPP, and she is a substitute member Member of the Special Committee on Cancer in the European Parliament. So welcome all. Thank you very much. If you, you're welcome to keep your cameras on or turn them off while the audience does the vote. Uh, but we're now going to go into the first round of polling where you get to pick the topic that you would like to discuss. 
So if we could see the poll, great. So there you have your options. So audience, which of the following clusters do you want to discuss first? Which one do you want to discuss in more detail for 25 minutes? Stronger collaborative endeavors for personalized oncology, option one. Option two, investing in infrastructure to address the challenges faced by personalized oncology. Or option three, improvements in the institutional structures surrounding personalized oncology treatments. So please vote now. And we'll just give it a little bit longer. Just to be clear here, personalized oncology, PO is personalized oncology, not patient organization, but thank you, Stefan, for pointing that out. So PO is personalized oncology. And I think we will close the poll now. So we are going to see the results of that, please. Okay, so let's have a look and see what people want to discuss. So. Option two seems to have the most choices with 40%, which is investing in infrastructure to address the challenges faced by personalized oncology. So we want to talk about investing in infrastructure. And then we'll come back and ask you to vote on options one and three later on. So Panos, can you talk us through very quickly the top line findings uh, when it comes to investing in infrastructure and recommendations? Just to clarify for the audience, we're keeping this very headline because we have such a large number of you from all parts of Europe here today and further afield that we're keeping it headline, but of course you can get more detail from the report later on. But Panos, if you could give us the key finding there, that would be great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you again, Laura. Well, I think we are coming up with uh, a series of uh, challenges in, uh, in, in, in infrastructure, which we are listing here uh, on the left-hand side, and um, a number of uh, policy options which we are uh, outlining on the on the right hand side. So challenges such as ensuring that novel research can benefit European patients, patients and societies, um, lack of critical mass in research centers, ensuring that we can effectively deal with big data, uh, the lack of knowledge regarding personalized oncology amongst physicians, ensuring access to diagnostics for all. So these are all challenges that we have identified as part of the um, uh, fused um, primary and secondary data collection. Uh, and we have uh, outlined some options as well. For example, the development of a European Institute that focuses on converting research into medicines. Uh, just looking at therefore, therefore at um, uh, European best practices, one of them comes uh, from the UK in this particular setting, um, to advocate for, a, for an EU harmonization of ethics uh, approval, ethical approvals for the sharing of anonymized patient data, again, important uh, to uh, respect patient uh, privacy and anonymity, uh, targeted action at national level to develop EU-wide biobanks for tissues and biofluids and high quality patient registries, again, and as well as coordination of these, uh, the connectivity of uh, personalized oncology big data flows in order to ensure that we have not only connectivity, but uh, uh, but also connectivity between the clinical community uh, experts and uh, and also scientists who uh, work on a quantity basis. Um, the, uh, the 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 uh, the lack of knowledge regarding the PO personalized oncology amongst physicians can be addressed by up to date information and uh, curricula for undergraduate and postgraduate courses. Um, and uh, in terms of ensuring access to diagnostics for all, as a challenge. Uh, we probably need, um, we propose uh, increased investment by national governments uh, in next generation technologies and incorporating these into uh, our armamentarium uh, uh, of, uh, of options for, uh, for patients. So these were, let's say, both the challenges, but also some of the quote unquote solutions or options that we are offering in the context of uh, this particular cluster of recommendations. Thank you very much, Panos. And in a moment, I'm going to get sort of top line thoughts and reaction uh, from our panel. But just to remind you in the audience, uh, in a moment, we will be opening the floor. So you can either raise your hand if you would like to uh, speak. So I will be making a totally randomized um, assessment of who gets to speak. Uh, and then also you can post your questions or comments in the chat box. Just a couple of pointers. We're going to be very strict on time. So if you do want to speak, you'll have 45 seconds. So please get to the point and also 
also tell us to whom your question or comment is focused because that will really help us to target the discussion in a, a sort of clear way. So just a reminder, you can post your, you can raise your hand or you can post in the Q&A, but not the chat. So just not the chat elsewhere. Okay, so Mark, look, I'm going to come to you first from the patient perspective. Is there anything that you'd like to comment on or add to what Panna said? Thank you very much indeed. Very much welcome this report. Um, and one of the very important parts of it is, and as you see, and I'm glad that topic two has been chosen in relation to having our discussion because it has the most that's relevant to patients. I think what's really important here is the principle of equality. And we need to make sure that personalized medicine is available for everybody. And that includes everybody through all of Europe. Um, I do have some reservations about a European institute because I want to make sure that actually personalized medicine gets to the patient. And that may involve the patient in their regional hospital um, as well as in the center. So it is important that we make sure that equity, for example, in Central and Eastern Europe, that people also have access to personalized medicine. And um, so that they would be my sort of initial thoughts. Um, and the other thing is that this has to be done for the patient, around the patient, and with the patient. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian, your quick top line thoughts and what would you add to this? Yeah, thank you very much. It's great to be able to comment on this excellent report and very much agree with the, uh, the good comments from uh, Dr. Lawler. I, I would maybe point a little bit to the opportunity around uh, big data. Um, and maybe even a data strategy or digital strategy for uh, personalized oncology. I think some well-targeted investments could help build the link that we need between data that's needed at the R&D stage to that which is needed at marketing authorization and then to support HTA decision-making. I think the need here is really uh, critical around those truly novel biomarkers where you know, when, we, when we get to the time of marketing authorization, some basic questions still haven't been answered. What's the incidence of the new biomarker? What's the prognosis? You know, how have patients done historically on standards of care? And I think if we have um, systems that, that allow us to track that kind of data um, from the earliest stages, from R&D forward, I think you know, this is, there's a great opportunity for that type of initiative. Thank you. Uh, Deirdre, tell us from a sort of parliamentary perspective, what would you add to this? How can you see the European Parliament taking this forward? Well, the European Parliament, Laura, has established a cancer committee in preparation for the, Euro for the uh, Commission's cancer strategy that they're going to announce. So um, we're looking at how we can best uh, work together and improve, uh, work together across Europe and improve services for, for patients and have patients at the centre of our focus. Uh, I would say that um, data and sharing of data is, is really, really important and much can be done there. And, you know, we're looking forward to the European health data space that's to be uh, produced next year. Uh, and that's, you know, really, I've, I feel will, will be a breaker in this whole, whole area, ensuring that, you know, information that's just in pockets across Europe can be shared for the benefit of, um, of patients. And I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to a European institution at European level, because I would see that that would benefit um, countries that don't have as an advanced services for their patients and that you have the sharing, sharing of information, sharing of best practice. And I think um, that can be a positive. And also maybe a, a European cancer dashboard uh, as part of the cancer plan as well, where we can um, you know, establish key indicators that can be, can be looked at and uh, to link and to tra track progress on, on personalized oncology. So I think there's a, a lot can be done uh, at a European level to, to improve uh, inf infrastructure and um, we've a lot of it in the making anyway and hopefully uh, it'll be, be able to bring that all to fruition. Thank you very much and yeah. yeah I, I could repeat everything that I've been said already but uh, I, I think I should focus on the fact that personalized oncology also means fragmented oncology because what we're seeing is that our patient groups are getting smaller and smaller and smaller so the challenge that we have to, is to get adequate data that would convince regulators to approve a drug and then HDA experts to uh, approve that drug for access to patients uh, at least. So I, I guess the issue is like Mark said in quality, I have my doubts also on a bureaucratic institution, but somehow collaboration is going to be key. Uh, and for big data, we've actually, and the Cancer Group Development Forum had a workshop on how can we use those big data. The problem there is that we currently have no, not sufficiently 
knowledge on truly how to uh, get those data and um, get them into a meaningful format. We don't know what those data mean. So that's something we need to learn quickly because they are there and it's, it's a potential wealth of information, but it should be structured in such a way that everybody understands what the data actually mean. Thank you very much. So obviously we've talked about the use of big data, uh, personalized oncology, fragmented oncology, uh, some differences in views about what value an institute would actually, a European level institute would actually bring, but maybe we can come back to that later. I'm gonna bring the audience in now. And of course the audience can also put questions or comments to panels. I see that we have two people with their hands raised in the audience. So I'm gonna invite them to speak uh, in a moment. I will then put their question or comment to the some different members on the panel, and then we'll go to the next one. And then we will also take some from the moderated Q&A uh, that has been written. So if I could ask Lydie Michius and Stefan, I apologize on the name pronunciation here, but if I could ask Lydie Michius and Stefan Giesels to unmute, uh, we will also give you speaking permissions. And Lydie, we will start with you. So um, could you tell us who your question is for, as well as just um, speaking? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. So I'm Lydie Mehus from the Anti-Cancer Fund, and my question is for panels and maybe also for Mark Lower. It's about the definition of precision of uh, personalized oncology, because my feeling is what you mean is precision oncology based on genomic analysis and mutations. Is that correct? Or do you really mean the more broader definition of precision oncology? Thank you. Okay, Panos, I'm going to let you come in on that. Mark, if you want to afterwards, then you may. Stefan, we'll come to you afterwards. Thank you. And, and, and I would like to, uh, to, to, to defer that question to my colleague, Jennifer, Jennifer Gill. Um, Jennifer, do you want to say a few words? Because we, yeah, we had fine. a long discussion about, about all this and obviously uh, personalized oncology. And I heard the, uh, the, the word earlier on about pragmatic oncology uh, and precision oncology are, are used almost interchangeably in the report. Is that, isn't that the case? Yes, thank you, Pano. So essentially, that was one of the issues we uh, raised in the report, the kind of lack of concrete definition across the EU uh, and across uh, the world. It's, um, lots of people using lots of different phrases. So we tend to focus in the report on the personalised oncology care continuum as a whole and um, precision oncology medicines, which would be those genomic um, medicines you mentioned, Lydia. Thank you. Uh, Mark, do you want to come in on that at all? Um, just, I mean, one way of looking at it is precision oncology to deliver personalised care for the patient is sometimes a way of looking at it, which can be helpful. Yeah, thank you. Okay, brilliant. Okay, Stefan Giesels, you are very welcome to speak now, but unmute yourself because you've muted yourself. So I think that's yes, going to have the opposite thank effect. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, my question is actually to all the panel members. I think we, we see uh, there's a strong correlation between the number of patients treated with a certain type of cancer and the actual outcome of the patient. So experience and expertise in a cancer center is absolutely critical. And we see with the more and more uh, sophisticated uh, knowledge that we have about the cause of cancer and the treatment options that are available, that smaller hospitals are incapable of, of following track. So I think it's, it's much, much, probably much, much better to have uh, knowledge centralized in the, in the centers with a lot of patients with a specific condition and maybe make access to these hospitals easier for people who are uh, in a more remote uh, location rather than to, to expect that every general hospital around the corner can follow with the science. That's impossible. And so as a patient representative, I mean, I think it's the, the, the number one thing for the, the patient that really matters is survival and not the price of a bus ticket to a local hospital. Sure. Mark, do you want to come in on that? And then I saw Yap nodding away as well. So I'll bring you in afterwards. Thanks very much, Stefan. Yes, no, I agree with that. My, my comment was in relation to bureaucracy. I was a little bit worried about one institute and the bureaucratic nature that it could become. I uh, very much agree with you that we need to deliver and um, personalized oncology within the confines of a cancer center that can actually deliver, have all aspects of the MBDT, work with the patients, um, very much, you know, very important. We want to be able to deliver better outcomes for patients. And so very much as one with you on that, Stefan, as you know. Thank you. And Yap. Yeah, to, to, to add to that, I think there are fantastic data over the last decades, uh, mainly from the UK that show that expertise of a 
of the doctors in centers uh, adds to the survival of patients. Um, in the Netherlands, actually, we have, a, we have a very small country, which makes it easier to organize things. But we have a system where uh, my colleagues from the academic institutions, so the experts, are actually consultants to the smaller regional uh, hospitals. So that means that they do not actually see all patients, but they can get access to all patients and give advice on the treatment of all patients. And sometimes that treatment can be given in the small sites, but at least it makes sure that there's an expert who knows a lot about a very small disease, a very minor entity that is giving the, the, uh, that expertise to the patient in the region. So that way we could set up systems where all patients in wherever Europe could benefit from the uh, expertise of the experts that we have. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm just having a look through to see what some of the questions are that have come in. Okay, so we've got a question from Kim Mai who asks, where do you think the pharmaceutical industry could help the most, locally or internationally? Well, obviously, Brian, I'm going to come to you on this first, but I will come to some of the others as well afterwards. Yeah, I think uh, first and foremost, I mean, it's generating the innovation, right, that, that, that uh, allows patients to benefit from these kinds of treatments and help, helping to, I think, build collaborations and coalitions that help us to understand what are the what are the pathways that need to exist in order to be able to rapidly bring access to new innovation to patients and to appropriately informed decision making by regulators and by HTA decision uh, decision makers? Thank you. Uh, did you, I know you wanted to come in also on the previous points, so feel free to pick up on that. Well, just on the previous points, and I think yeah, I probably finished up on that as well. I mean, I, I, I absolutely, um, in terms of the, the term center for of excellence, comes to mind. But I think we can do it at a European level as well as rather than just individual countries. And I think there's a lot of expertise and knowledge that we could, if we can develop structures where we can share that information and benefit all regions. I think, I think that's very important because not every country has the same levels of investment. So I think that's important as regards uh, the pharmaceuticals, uh, pharmaceuticals and how that, how that can feed in. Well, I think um, we've been we're looking at uh, the new EU for health strategy and where is that going to focus and there is more money available for investment in research we will, I suppose we want to collaborate as well with, with the private sector to ensure that between between both um, funding is leveraged to, uh, and in investment in research is leveraged for the best outcomes and best benefit for the patients and I think that's re that's really important. Okay, that's great. We have another question that's come in. Uh, somebody asks, how can we improve and deepen cooperation with patient groups? So, I mean, gosh, that could go to any of you, really, but I suppose Mark starts, and then I'm going to bring the rest of you in, but very briefly, if that's all right. Top left, and Panos as well. You can all come in, but it's got to be 15 seconds, everyone, because I know this is a good question, but we want to get more of them in. And don't forget, audience, <clears> please <throat> do raise your hand if you want to ask your question in person or keep them coming in the Q&A. So, Mark, Mark, yes, you first. Patient advocacy groups deliver absolutely essential support for cancer patients and their caregivers. And really one of the things I feel is we really need to be supporting that at European level, uh, particularly in the current context of the COVID-19 pandemic, because that really has had a huge effect on the resources of patient advocacy groups. So we really need to be supporting patient advocacy groups at European level, as well as at national level, because they are the ones that are delivering a lot of the absolute care that patients need that are not being delivered by health systems. Okay, this is great. Mark, could you, could you break down what you mean a little bit more by that support so that Deirdre has something useful that she can take back to her committee? <laughs> well, I, I think you know, one of the things that we see is in relation to patient advocacy groups have, have superb networks that go across Europe and um, into individual countries. And they also have that level of expertise that actually is not available a lot. Also, they are trusted uh, by cancer patients and by cancer um, caregivers. And so there's, there's really absolute brilliant you know, sort of work being done there. And a lot of that is going to be lost in the current scenario because they're under huge pressure in relation to resources, in relation to the ability to connect with their um, patient groups. So I, I really feel that that's something that, and that could be something very practical, Deirdre, and um, that the commission could do as well um, to really support that. Because uh, otherwise okay. we'll lose that expertise and it'll be very difficult to get it back. Deirdre, do you want to come in on that quickly? Obviously, well, no, just, just, I do. I want to reaffirm that I hear you, Mark. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and it's something that we've been, we've already discussed about, uh, you know, how can we bring patients with us? Because if you want patients to benefit that most, absolutely, it has to be patient focused. 
will then need th those that are, are advocate on their behalf and need more resources and very conscious of the gap that has has a, uh, has has developed over the last nine months is it with with COVID. so very conscious of that i can only say I, I agree with you and will reinforce that message thank you thank, thank you, you and panel Panos, I know you wanted to come in very briefly on this point as well, and then we're going to take another question from the audience. So, yes, right. Panos. Super. Uh, patients are expert at patient relevant outcomes. So we need to study what these outcomes are. They need to tell us patients are, uh, are telling us what these outcomes can be, what, these, what the relevant endpoints can be at regulatory level uh, when we design clinical trials, but also at uh, health technology assessment come reimbursement level in terms of uh, commenting on scoping reports, uh, bringing their own perspective uh, to uh, uh, reimbursement panels or, uh, or HDA panels. Absolutely essential, therefore, to keep in mind um, and bring that evidence to the table, because at the end of the day, we're talking about evidence here and beyond clinical trials, beyond clinical uh, opinion, um, and the evidence from clinical trials and clinical opinion, we also have patient uh, relevant outcomes and what matters to patients and what it means for patients to live with the disease. So I think it's, uh, it's effectively essential to, uh, to, to, to take that into account. Back to the uh, previous question, uh, I, I think I would like to underscore the importance of uh, centers of excellence in providing cancer care and specialized cancer care. Uh, but also, let's not forget about the European reference uh, reference centres. We have a large number of European reference centres, uh, a lot of which relate, obviously, to um, to uh, uh, to oncology services. So uh, we we do have a network. We need to strengthen that network. Yeah, absolutely. That's great, Panos. And some Roger. I mean. Mark, you have a fan in the audience. Roger Wilson writes, Mark, you're completely right. COVID is placing almost intolerable stresses and has knocked out F to F support and is cutting contributions to patient led defined research. Oh, you've already written back. OK, there we go. Fantastic. Uh, great. OK, so we have one final question before we end this particular round. Time flies when you're having fun, right? Uh, but we have a final question, which I do want the entire panel to answer. But again, short, snappy answers. So Francesco Florindi writes, the gap between research and treatment is still too wide, even if we all agree on a vision of personalized medicine that's circular, what would be your top practical solution? So Brian, I'm going to start with you, followed by Yap, please. I think we need to, we need to follow the science and we need to incorporate patient, uh, patients at all levels of uh, research, discovery, drug development, HTA decision making and regulatory processes. I think this is, this is our true north. Thank you very much. Okay, Yap. Yeah, I think we should make more use of uh, what's been done at academia because they also develop a lot of target innovation, target uh, identification. I don't think academia will ever be able to produce drugs and, and further uh, <clears throat> pre perform the studies, but the collaboration between academia and, and pharmaceutical industry is key here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Panos? Well, I think we've seen a, a, a number of uh, improvements over the last 10, 15 years. I think we've seen at the regulatory level, prime, we've seen uh, accelerated approvals, we've seen uh, conditional marketing authorization, a better integration of all of these, obviously, and, 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 and stronger collaboration between regulators and reimbursement agencies or HTA agencies would be absolutely essential. But at the same time, perhaps the strengthening of uh, compassionate use uh, programs to, to ensure that we have immediate access uh, to those medicines that hold significant promise for patients. Okay, that's great. I lied to you all, I'm afraid. We're actually going to take one more question now because it's good. So that's the exciting part. Okay, so we have a question from Dimitar Georgiev. There is a huge need for equalizing the differences east, west and north, south in Europe. Could you please comment? I mean, who would like to take that one? In term, I mean, Deirdre, I'll come to you for a political view at the end, but you know, who wants to bite this one? Deirdre or uh, Laura, I'll take it. Um, so Thank you, Mark. I agree. Um, something that we've been doing with the European Cancer Organization is looking at the east west divide, and we really need to solve this. And the European Union and Europe can help us to do that. And we need to look at ways in which we actually can reduce the divide. What we absolutely don't want to do is that personalized oncology actually ends up widening that divide mm -hmm. to access to essential um, medicines and diagnostics. Um, and so one of the things we should look at is, you know, for example, twinning approaches that can help us. The other thing is we need to make sure that we don't get a brain drain from Central and Eastern Europe into the West. And um, particularly in the current situation, we want to make sure that we're providing appropriate um, support 
um, for the systems in Central and Eastern Europe. And that's a, an area where the European Cancer Organization and the European Cancer Patient Coalition are very much pushing. That's great, thank you. Would any, um, Deirdre, I'm gonna to come to you just to sort, of, to sort of have a look at the political side of this in a moment and the role of the Parliament. Panos, I know you want to comment briefly as well. And then we're gonna wrap up with Deirdre and move to our next session. Just, just, just a brief comment. I think uh, it, this is not only related to personalized oncology. I think it's a broader, it is a broader issue of access uh, in terms of both availability, but also affordability. It's a complex question. Uh, and, and a complex issue. And one of the reasons why I said at the beginning, this uh, report needs to be seen in conjunction with other initiatives. I think the commission has come up uh, with uh, a strategy for pharmaceuticals, for example, for, for treatments. And I think we need to consider uh, some, of the, some of the options here. And one of the key issues here relates to uh, availability, but also affordability. Uh, so I need to, uh, to address that question you know, more prominently uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the days, months and years to come, so that there is not only the clinical expertise, but also the, um, uh, the, the issue around finance, because some of the issues relate to finance, obviously, and we need to, uh, we, we need to address that. Thank you very much. And uh, Deirdre, do you want to uh, sort of wrap this up from a political well, point? Yeah. I do. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, do, well, the EU, the cancer plan and the cancer strategy is all about that, is reducing inequalities and how to support and coordinate activities and it is it is about investing in resources as well as and collaboration is going to be very much part of it as well and i i, I can see that this is another area that, that where the european union together can help in terms of sharing information and supporting where, where there are gaps identify them and support it uh, and that, that's what the, the union is about so i'd hope that the cancer st strategy that the commission is going to propose next year will be a framework within which we can do that. And I suppose remember against this is against the background where the European Union doesn't re, doesn't have a role as such in, in medicine in, in, at national level, but there is, a, but it has an overarching overseeing uh, policy. And we, we and there's been much discussion in the parliament since COVID started about, and in, in the, with the commission as well, since COVID started about having more action, uh, more EU action in, in the health area. And I think we've seen a debate and a conversation starting now where we're going to see Europe having um, playing more of a role in, in this area uh, for the benefit of citizens. That's great. Thank you very much. So that actually brings us to the end of round one. So thank you very much, panel, for your great comments and also audience, great questions, great comments. I'm sorry we couldn't get through more of them now, but you still have two more bites at this because we're now going to ask you to vote on which one you want to talk about next. So which topic would you like to talk about for 15 minutes? Uh, and remember, this is positive elimination. So vote for the topic that you want to talk about. Uh, which of the following clusters do you want to discuss first? Is it option one, stronger collaborative endeavors for personalized oncology? Or is it option three, which is improvements in the institutional structures surrounding personalized oncology treatments? So remember, you're voting for the one you want to give more time to. And it's the similar format as before. Please vote now. Okay, and we are going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. And do we have results? We do have results. 60% of you basically would like to talk about improvements in the institutional structures surrounding personalized oncology treatments. So we're gonna go for option three first, which will have 15 minutes, and then that will leave us 10 minutes for stronger collaborative endeavors for personalized oncology. Okay, so we're gonna go back to Panos for a quick overview here. So Panos, do you wanna talk through option three for the audience exactly? Sure. Um Again, we have listed um, the challenges that we have encountered in the, um, uh, in the evidence base we have reviewed, both from a primary and a secondary data collection standpoint, and also made some suggestions about uh, potential solutions. So in terms of challenges, enhancing the provisions on personalized oncology, uh, the clinical designs, which are traditional and not, do not easily apply to personalized oncology treatments, uh, relevance, staying relevant in terms of evidence evaluation, possible short-term uh, high costs, uh, and whether the, these are balanced off, balanced out with uh, long-term uh, uh, 
uh, issues and, and, and affects short-term costs of ensuring patient access to biomarker testing. So these are all significant challenges. Against this background of challenges, we have suggested a number of uh, uh, potential solutions. So with regards to enhancing provisions on personalized oncology, we have suggested the development of simplified and harmonized regulatory procedures accounting for certain um, personalized oncology specifics, for example, smaller patient numbers in clinical trials. Again, this is, um, uh, this is uh, almost a fair complete, but uh, when we're looking at traditional clinical designs not easily applying to personalized treatment, then uh, we're advocating for support for more progressive clinical trial design to suit the um, PO paradigm of very small patient, uh, patient populations. And that takes us into the whole agenda about uh, quote-unquote novel trial designs. Um, the, uh, the acceptance by HDA agencies of data generated by novel uh, clinical trial designs, you know, is, has been uh, an issue in the past and probably we need to uh, revisit that. Um, the assessment of value to move towards broader long-term concept overall, of overall economic benefit or economic value taking into account the total uh, value of personalization and considering the cost of sets by ruling out ineffective treatment options. So a more holistic uh, approach to, uh, to benefit from a socioeconomic perspective. Um, it may be challenging, but uh, uh, it is probably essential to consider that, to start considering that more seriously. And finally, advocating to ensure that patient access to biomarket testing and reimbursement actually exists. And with that, effectively, we're looking at um, uh, safeguarding and enhancing uh, equity uh, across the union. So these were, in a nutshell, both the challenges, but also the uh, uh, potential options or solutions for uh, this cluster. That's great. Thank you very much for that overview, panels. Uh, I'm going to just as I'm going to get reaction from the panel, just their top line thoughts again in a moment. But just to remind you as the audience, as ever, if you'd like to comment or ask questions in this round, do raise your hand if you want to do it in person. You'll have 45 seconds, uh, but we will let you speak. Uh, or you can post your questions in the Q&A. So, uh, Brian, I'm going to start with you in terms of giving a response to what panels just talked about and the cluster uh, they outlined. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll take us a little bit back to the discussion we were having about building out centers of, of excellence uh, related to knowledge transfer, disseminating standards. I think there's a huge opportunity for building on the existing institutions, external reference networks, the existing clinical, uh, uh, clinical trial networks that are existing in, in Europe, and building into what uh, the Mission Board on Conquering Cancer is referred to as comprehensive cancer infrastructures. I think these would, would have a very um, broad role in understanding disparities at the local level and would have the opportunity, I think, to build the kind of research platforms that we need to be able to progress and monitor progress in precision oncology. Thank you very much. Yap, what are your thoughts? Well, I agree with Brian. I mean, it, it's basically important to make sure that we all collaborate. The world is no longer a small country. It's one big country, and we should acknowledge that. And in a fragmented world, we have to. I think it's also important to focus on bigger benefits. Um, we've wasted a lot of time uh, trying to show that we can have a one week longer survival with statistical significance. Uh, it may not be the same as clinical relevance. If we start focusing on the, the, the issues that truly matter and do that in a collaborative way, we can achieve much more. And I think then we have to be very smart uh, and um, think out of the box to design novel types of trial that everybody, including HDA agencies, will in the end hopefully accept as a good trial that shows us that something new that is really beneficial to a patient. Thank you very much. Before I go to the other uh, speakers, I just want to remind the audience that please, if you're going to ask a question, whether it's in person or via the chat, the q and it's we should we'll be taking questions and comments on investing in infrastructure. So it's going to be very much that is the focus, um, I think. No, it's the improvements in institutional structures. I apologize. I'm getting confused with my first one. Institutional structures, that's what we're taking questions on right now. So apologies for that. Uh, but anyway, okay, so I, we've, got, we've done Brian, we've done Yap, we, are get, we have heard from Panos. So Deirdre, what are your thoughts on what you've yeah, heard? Thanks, thanks, Laura. Yeah, well, I think um, we need to do, obviously, it's to throw back to the previous discussion as well. We need to do something on data. And to that we can harness data, sh share data in, in an anonymized fashion. I think that's very important. And I hear a lot from the panelists about HTA and how they come to decisions. So obviously, I think uh, 
something needs to be, be done in, in that area as well. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. And Mark, final thought from you on this before we take questions, comments from the audience. I agree with Deirdre, I need to get rid of the data silos. The data needs to flow responsibly, but effectively. Uh, the other thing is we, we talked a little bit there about the cost. Um, I would say, what about the cost of not testing, for example? So the cost of not doing biomarker testing is much bigger to patients than the cost of testing. And so we really need to change that argument around. And, and finally, um, as, as Yap said, and I agree with them totally, your know, p-value doesn't matter to a patient. And um, so we really need to do real meaningful change that actually leads to improved outcomes, but also better quality of life. So we have to be collecting patient reported outcomes, real time data um, and real world evidence. And, and that way we will change things. Thank you very much, Mark. So we've got two hands raised in the audience. So I'm going to take questions from Luis Correa and also from, from, from Francesco Florindi. And we'll also take one from the Q&A uh, as well. So if Luis, if you could unmute and actually also Francesco so that we know that your mic will work. Luis, Can you guys hear me? Perfectly. Perfect. So I have actually two questions. So one question would be direct to the HTA. So one of the biggest hurdles that we see in HTA right now is actually the kind of disconnect between the test or the CTX and the drug. So there are two parallel C HTAs taking place. So what are the road towards having both drug and test coming hand in hand and reflecting that into reimbursement? And then the other part would be, so we are talking a lot about data, but yet um, there are lots of decisions be taken on multidisciplinary tumor board, new case of treatment and exploring of label treatment. So how to make it easier, those kind of one, uh, you know, end of one clinical trials and to capture this into data banks in order to enable this generation of real world evidence that can both benefit patients and pharma industry. Thank you very much. Okay, so Brian, I'm going to have, um, pass both of the to you in the first instance, then I'm going to bring in Yap and possibly Mark and Panos if they want to afterwards, but perhaps we could start with Brian on this. Yeah, yeah, very briefly. I think um, very important question. I mean, that we are um, in an environment in which the decision making related to the diagnostics and decision making related to the availability of drugs. So these are separate processes, separate systems. And they need to be brought together, I think, at the earliest stages. So as, as again, we've talked about, you know, when you have truly novel biomarkers that are moving rapidly through development, uh, that you have the development of the diagnostics and you have mechanisms to ensure that you have the appropriate diagnostics that are available at the time of the marketing authorization for the drug. Um, I think this is one of the important collaborations we need to begin talking about. Yeah. Thank you very much. And yeah. I think we can lot, learn a lot on uh, the use of diagnostics as well for in the studies that are ongoing worldwide with repurposing of existing drugs where we're using genetic information or other biomarkers to identify patients that could benefit from a drug that they're normally not, would not have access to. And we were learning negatively there, we're learning positively there. So this is one way forward to use, not it is not N of one, but N of a few <laughs> uh, patient trials to hopefully convince the regulatory authorities that of those drugs, at least we could have a, an expansion of the label. Um, and this could also help in identifying new drugs. Mm -hmm. We cannot hear you, uh, Laura. You, Laura. We, you're you're Laura, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> we all thought oh. we would have mastered this by now. <laughs> Do you know that's actually the first time it's happened, which I feel quite proud of. Other things regularly go wrong. Uh, I will not be denied the option to make, you know, the opportunity to make my voice heard. So, but we are going to hear from Francesco Florindi now. So, Francesco, if you are unmuted, please feel welcome to ask your question and also tell us who it's for. Uh, hi everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thanks again. And I love the question from the uh, from the previous attendee about N of one trials. I want to go the same direction. Uh, mine is going to be a question for for all speakers, more on the um, uh, again institutional level. Uh, we you mentioned some of the uh, measures to be taken, but I'm more curious about the actors. Who would you like to be involved in creating this trustworthy environment where data uh, samples, uh, patient clinical information can be shared? 
so that personalized medicine can, can really happen. And I focus on the trust because um, for the organization I work, that's exactly where, you know, we wouldn't exist without the trust of patients, without the, uh, the donations and the altruism of, of patients to give away their, their samples and data. But this trust, I'm afraid, is not shared among all the actors that needs to be uh, involved. So um, what's your take on this? Thanks. Thank you. So did you tell, did you tell us who that question's for? Is it a more general one? Uh, it's really general for everyone. Okay, so who'd like to have a go at that? I mean, obviously, Mark, I know you would, but uh, and Panos and Deirdre. Okay, great. So Mark first, uh, then Deirdre, and then Panos, if that's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Francesco. Um, the key thing here is fair value. Um, fair value for the patient first, fair value for the National Health Service, fair value for academia, fair value for industry. So we need to have a fair value principle governing uh, how we use data, and that's critically important. Uh, and all of those actors need to be involved, and that's why what the opposite said earlier is very important. You know, we are a united Europe, so therefore we need to work together. And um, just going back to the previous point in relation to diagnostics, um, it's really important. I mean, we have a European paradox at the moment where drugs can be approved, and yet the companion diagnostics that you use to actually select out the particular population of patients who will, who will benefit from the drug is not approved because it's from a different agency. I mean, why does that make any sense? Absolutely no sense at all. That is not to the benefit of patients. Thank you. Deirdre? Uh, yes, well, I think... Um... This is a big question on data and developing trust and ensuring that we do have trust from from patients uh, in data and you know this is something that like that brings into questions such as options and governance infrastructure the quality um, uh, sol solidarity is another word as well and helping citizens with, with, with building trust and understanding what the data is going to be used for. I think that's going to be going to be really be crucial I hear think of things like code of conduct for using health data, that's going to be important. And, you know, there is a, a health data space to be proposed in 2020, which is next year, 2021. So I think these are all questions and it's vital that we do get it correct, we get it right. If we are to move uh, to sharing data, um, it is really important that we do it because, and it's in, it's in everybody's interest that we have structures in place that actually have, that are built on trust and transparency is very important. And a very important word is a word we kick around a lot, but I think uh, the two are, are linked together, trust and transparency, and with one will come the other. Thank you. And Panos, briefly from you, if you would. Just to, yes, thank you. Uh, just to highlight the importance of uh, using the data and the information at national level. I, obviously, I echo and underscore the, the importance of a digital health strategy. Many countries, if not most, do have it. Member states do have a national digital strategy. I think it's important. We need to reflect on the use of that data at national level to shape and inform policy. And if I was to go back to the previous question about the disconnect between the drugs and the uh, and the diagnostics, one additional stakeholder we need to uh, to bring in and discuss is obviously competition authorities. I think that is that is crucial because you may have circumstances where the drug comes from a different um, uh, producer and the diagnosis comes from an entirely different range of producers. How do you combine? the two into a meaningful package of care and service for patients is, uh, is also a matter for uh, competition, uh, competition authorities at national or even supranational level. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for one question from the Q&A, which is going to be a, it's going to be very short answers uh, from the panel, if they would. So what do you think the future would look like for the marketing authorization and national reimbursement across Europe, as these timings are now very varied, causing differences across countries and creating access discrepancies? So I think I'm going to put this one to Brian. And also Panos and Yap, if you want to come in on as well, you may. I mean, and also... I mean, Mark, if you have thoughts on it, you're welcome to, but I'm going to take it industry first, if I can. Thank you. Mark, you're uh, Brian, you're muted. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I want to believe that this is a very, very solvable issue. I think this is around coming to alignment around the evidence standards for developing uh, precision oncology treatments that, that are accepted by both the regulators and by the HTA decision-making bodies. Um, we see that reimbursement is a huge driver uh, in, in disparities across Europe for something that has been well accepted at the regulatory level. And I think you know this is something that uh, really is at the top of the list to try to address. Uh, yeah. 
I, I agree with Brian, and I think this should be done on a European level, because clearly the problem is fragmented throughout Europe. And we've just published a paper with a, an astonishing difference in access to actual marketed drugs between Western parts of Europe and Eastern parts of Europe, where it can differ from one day to four years, which I think is totally unacceptable. And that needs to be solved at a European level. There's no other way. Thank you. Panos, do you want to add to this quickly? Uh, very quickly, I think I think we need to reflect on uh, uh, existing and new mechanisms. I think there there is a draft regulation for on on uh, uh, European cooperation on health technology assessments. Uh, uh, somewhere in the process, I think we need to reflect on uh, on that one. Sometimes the discrepancies in um, time to coverage relate not only to different, uh, let's say, processes and approaches, which I think we can standardize somehow, uh, but also different approaches to, uh, to to negotiation. So the culprit may not be, let's say, the uh, the coverage recommendation and the evidence review. The culprit sometimes is in the detail and in the differential, in the different ways that member states negotiate on access. So I think that needs to be not necessarily standardized, but I think uh, uh, options to be explored uh, to rectify it somehow. Thank you very much. Okay, so that brings us to the end of round two, and we are going to move into our final section, uh, which of course we don't need to vote on um, because we know what we're going to be talking about. So Panos, can you talk us about the, uh, I think it's cluster one uh, that we're on now, which is about right. ways to yeah. improve collaboration. Okay, so again, very briefly, just to maximize the time we have for, for conversation, a number of challenges, uh, improving and accelerating research and development on personalized oncology, um, lack of effective or sufficient collaboration between key stakeholders. And I think, we, uh, uh, I think we, we've kind of alluded to uh, that earlier on in terms of enhanced collaboration as a proposal uh, and a solution between key stakeholders, uh, academia, pharma industry, diagnostic manufacturers, the European Medicines Agency notified bodies. We have the heterogeneity in the HTA decision-making process. Again, that has been reflected on uh, somehow. Um, so what we need there is, is perhaps a closer collaboration between regulators and health technology assessment uh, agencies to ensure uh, both transparent, but also well-informed. Uh, decision-making processes and the lack of uh, health literacy on personalized oncology amongst patients and society. Obviously, the the option here or the solution, if you would like, is for patient organizations and advocacy groups to work towards giving literacy a higher priority so that patients feel empowered. Um, going back to the first uh, issue about improving and accelerating R&D in uh, personalized oncology, more of a joint European strategy and roadmap for personalized oncology uh, use. So I'll pause here. And I'm going to make sure I unmute there. Okay, so obviously this is the final round now. So you have one, ch you have your chance to ask questions, make comments as well. Uh, but we've only got about eight minutes left for this, so it is going to be short and snappy. So before we do that, though, quick top line thoughts from the panel. So Mark, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, health, health literacy incredibly important. I've just put something in the chat in relation to a co-created um, guide. Um, for patients on personalized medicine and that's just been produced by ECPC, uh, co-created between patients, healthcare professionals and patient advocates. Um, it is really important because that can really empower patients um, to be able to make the critical decisions um, in relation to um, both access to personalized medicine, but also the difficult questions that they may want to ask. Um, and we provide a list of 10 questions that patients and may use in, in their uh, consultation with their doctor, but the patients need to be involved in the process. I, I note on the uh, f, uh, list there that stakeholders doesn't include patients specifically in the overall process. So that's really important that st patients are involved in all aspects of personalized medicine, not just without literacy. Deirdre. Sorry, on mute. Yeah, well, I absolutely, I think um, empowerment of patients is, is, is central to this. And I think the word collaborations we have to use and we need, absolutely do need more collaboration, even in the areas of like Horizon 2020, the uh, EU funding stream for investment innovation and uh, are in the EU for health, the new program for health. We need to ensure that we, well, we, can, we can work there to ensure that we fund projects that are collaborative and that work, work together. I mean, issues such as universities or third level sector academia sharing information as well I think um, you know it's all from a and, and it's all from a European perspective and there is so much 
happening across Europe, but we need to bring it together, collaborate, ensure that it's efficient as well, that what's happening is efficient uh, and that um, stronger, strong, where we have stronger information is areas that are stronger can benefit the weaker, bring us all to, to one level. So I think we know we know where we we know where we want to go. Absolutely, if collaboration is a centre of it, and I think and the the European Cancer Plan uh, strategy moving forward is certainly a platform where we can put the framework in place uh, to bring bring to bring bring it together: academia, patients, industry, uh, and those um, and those working in in the in the healthcare area. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Yes, I think we need to follow the science. Uh, patients are critical to this uh, endeavor. Regulators, HTA decision makers, collaboration is really central to, to uh, coming and creating pathways forward. Thank you, and yeah. Well, I think we're still at the early stages of personalized oncology. So this is the time to really try to make an effort to create one roadmap for personalized oncology. And that should involve patients, academia, pharmaceutical industry, regulatory authorities, and HTA. And I don't see why it could not be possible to do it. We should just do it. That's the spirit. Uh, thank you. OK, great. So we have a question from Stefan Giesels uh, in the audience. So Stefan, you know the score because I think you've asked one before. Do ask your question and tell us who it is for. Yes, again, to the whole panel, thank you. Um, I think we are at the moment at 1% of patient engagement in what I would call the entire decision making process. Uh, I think very often in our experience, uh, we are token representatives. Um, for research groups, we get invited a month before submission to, set, to send a letter uh, of support to the project without any, ever benefiting from anything coming out of it. Uh, the European Commission asked us to participate, but we do not get funded by the European Commission. Uh, we have not been invited by the European Parliament to come and speak to them about uh, the cause of digestive cancers, the group who we represent. Uh, I think for the majority of pharmaceutical companies, there is no systematic engagement for patient engagement in uh, research. So I think there's a lot of lip service and I think it will be fantastic if that really turns into something meaningful, uh, systematic, more robust. I think we often get questions about, do you have the expertise uh, internally to do this, that, and the other. I think we are the experts. I mean, there is not one product on the market that is not being designed and co-designed by the people buying it. You know, whether you're talking about shoes or uh, furniture or lamps or uh, software technology. Um, in healthcare, that's different. We are not part of the equation. We're not part of the process. Sure. So I think we need a much, much stronger commitment uh, at European level and uh, mm -hmm. from industry and academia. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. So, um, Mark, I'm going to get you actually to come in at the end uh, because I'd like Deirdre and then Brian to pick up on this first, if they would. So, Deirdre, just just to sort of quote Stefan back, how do you turn lip service into systematic, meaningful engagement with patients groups so that it's actually not a, an add-on? Well, yeah, I, I hear Stefan, yes, and I, I mean, I think you ensure that they're listened to and if he hasn't been invited to speak at, or uh, to to speak to the parliament um, i'm sure we, we i can pass on his context to the, to the to the, to, uh, to what we, to do, to the work we're doing that he can be included in that but i think patients i mean it's something that is true of the cancer strategy patients have to be centered and unless you have patients i think you can run away with it a lot of the time with all that at the high level discussion but in fact unless you bring patients with you uh, and have them part of it, have, that have their trust and, and their understanding as well. I think it's, 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 it's really central to it. I, I can only but agree with them. Yeah, I could only agree as well. I mean, I think um, compared to where we were 10 years ago when I joined industry, I think we've made great strides, but I think there's far more that we can do. And um, I think this is, I know Bear values all of the engagements that we have with patient-to-patient -patient organizations across um, across the different touch points that we have. Thank you, Mark. Uh, one of the things I am a scientific director of DataCon, and maybe this is a model about how we should be doing it, because I'm fed up hearing people saying, "Oh yeah, we should have patients on board." So do it. So here's an example: uh, on our steering board, which is our top board, there are more patients than any other. Uh, uh, sector on, the, on there. On our management boards, there are patients who 
side exactly the same. So have the exact same as me in relation to making decisions. On each of our projects, a patient is involved and actually uh, drives the, um, the, you know, the decision making there. In our interactions with industry, in our interactions with academia, in our interactions with other patients and members of the public, they're involved. So, yo, know, it's not difficult. Just bloody do it. Excuse my French. Make it easy, right? So as yeah, someone put in the exactly. chat box, like provide financial support. Yeah, so, it, it. so it is so it is doable. And, 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 and also it makes for better research. So we actually find that our research is better because patients are involved, because as Stefan said, they are the experts. So I'm I, fed up about you know, saying, oh yeah, we agree, patients should be part of the process. Make them centre to the process actually, not theoretically, actually. It also, um, as my two cents worth, which I know nobody wanted, it also makes for better public affairs and communications as well. I mean, not just that, but bring the patients in because they're the, the heart of all of this. Um, OK, so thank you very much, everyone. Right. We're going to wrap up in a moment. So I'm going to get one final comment from everybody on the panel. Thank you very much to the audience. Uh, we're a little bit tight on time, so that's why we're afraid we're going to close here. But one final thing or one final practi practical recommendation to take this forward. So how we can move more swiftly to seeing personalized oncology. If you want to repeat something that you've already said, that's absolutely fine, but make it simple and clear so that the audience has some nice, neat list that they can write down and take away with them today. So Panos, I'm going to start with you because of going back to the author of the report, or co-author of the report. That's right. <clears throat> and, and, and thank you. Thank you, Laura. I think it's high time we thought more intensely uh, about European collaboration in this context. Thank you very much. OK, what does that mean? How does it, that take it forward? It, it means uh, greater collaboration amongst the member states, uh, uh, institutions building, data sharing, capacity okay. building, training. Uh, Mark spoke about patients being obviously at the centre. There is a, a lot, an awful lot of challenges there to address in terms of educating mm -hmm. uh, uh, patient and patient organisations, greater collaboration, greater participation at... Uh, uh, European uh, at European in European institutions. Obviously, there is the EMA uh, here, yeah. uh, but also at national HDA uh, participation, national HDA organisations. I think it's thank high you. time we thought about that. Okay, thank you, Mark. I'm going to come to you next briefly. What's the first thing that you think needs to happen now to make patients central to all of this? Um, two things: one, put the centre, and the second thing is, you know, the statement that health is not a European competency should be trust thrown in the bin. Uh, COVID has shown that health has to be a European competency. We have to work together. You know, we're fudging the issue if we simply fire it back to the national uh, situation. So, so now is the opportunity to really empower. We're in a great situation, European uh, Beating Cancer Plan, your EU cancer mission, uh, Stella Kyriakides is uh, very much uh, you know, the health and um, food safety commissioner who is very pro doing something about cancer. We have a brilliant opportunity now. Let's take it. Mm. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Yeah, I, thanks, Laura. I see a hashtag there, change the treaties, and may come to that <laughs> if we want to, um, to change, uh, to change uh, healthcare. But I do think uh, Mark is absolutely right that um, COVID has shown that we need to do more at European level. And we did do more. And there yeah. was even from a purchasing from a, a joint purpose, something as simple as that, buying yeah. for European countries with a vaccine now that's going to be rolled out. We see your EU action that's benefiting all citizens and all, all countries will get uh, the vaccine equally based on population. But that's how, how, it's, how it's operating. And that's what we need to get to in, in, in cancer, cancer care. And I think, you know, the word collaboration and sharing and bridging the gaps and bringing the weaker weaker on and, and supporting them where we can. I think they're all, all part of the language. Every panelist has it, but I think it's it's really, really important that we, we have the capacity to work at the European level. We've seen that we can do it and uh, we need just the will to do it now and move on. Thank you very much. Yeah, final thought from you on how to move this forward practically. Well, it would be repetitive mostly. So let me, let me be brief. Get rid of borders. <clears throat> Yeah. Have okay. a plan and let's just do it. Okay. Stop. Get rid of borders. That's your other hashtag, Deirdre. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, the year of magical thinking, right? Uh, and Brian, final thought from you. Yeah, I would take us back to where Pano, Pano started, which is the need for a, a roadmap of change and agree with the perspectives on COVID and really how that has demonstrated what political necessity can do in terms of driving change. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to all our speakers uh, for sort of being part of this afternoon, particularly also to the London School of Economics for talking so much about their report. So thank you very much, Panos. Thank you also to the audience for being so game in participating and designing the structure and just going with the flow this afternoon. I am told that we asked 20 questions in the space of an hour and 15 minutes and they were answered. There are more in the box, but there may be an opportunity to follow up at a later point. But also remember, you can also download the study and read it and take it away from today. Lots more information there, which will probably answer your questions. But in the meantime, thank you all very much for taking part. I hope you found the discussion useful uh, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you Laura.